for us, should it not be also logical assumption and reasonable deduction that we ought to be a reflection of the faithfulness of God? I'll tell you how good God is in His faithfulness. The Bible says even when we are not faithful, yet He remains faithful. Amen. It just, you can't beat that. Yeah. So why did you come to the Lord in the first place if not to know the fact that regardless of your shortcomings, He's going to be faithful? Regardless of your failures, He's going to be there. We come to God because of this. Your faithfulness needs to be proclaimed and lauded throughout every generation. You're faithful to me to all generations. His faithfulness. Now, this God is trying to make us into His likeness. So the closer we get to God and the more of His love we have in our hearts, then it produces faithfulness because He is faithful. Revelation chapter 9, can't remember, you can look it up, good homework for you. Revelation chapter 19, I said 9, but I meant 19, you should have known that. <laughs> Revelation 19, if somebody can find it, that'd be great, but it says that on His thigh, engraved, written on the thigh of Jesus as he was riding the horse, the white horse. One thigh was written true. One, one of his thighs, <coughs> honey, I missed my pants. How did you let this happen? I have to stand there, but I just noticed that. You don't let me do things like that. On one of his thighs was written true. Has anybody seen that yet in Revelation 19? What verse? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Because I'm, I'm just speaking, right? It, huh? 16. There it is. At least I have the chapter right. What was on the other thigh? Faithful. On one thigh was true. And the other side, the other thigh, faithful. Is that correct? Is that what you have in yours? He's got 19, 16, but it doesn't say that. His thigh, name is King of King, Lord of Lords, that's not the one. There has to be another verse in chapter 19. But I'm trying to tell you, making the point, is that on one thigh was written true, and the other thigh written faithful. In other words, he was so true to his character traits that the term faithful was literally imprinted on his thigh. Now, God's not into tattooing. Just in case, God does not run a tattoo shop. All right? But it just so happens that God burned into his thigh. Faithful and true. That's why we have come to him in the first place. And faithfulness and truth does not. What does it do? Good to see it, Teresa. Faithfulness and truth, what does it do? Why did he put it on his legs? What does that tell you? Think about it. Come on, pastors. That was his walk. Yeah, boy, now you're talking my language. Huh? It was his walk. He walked as truth and he walked as faithful. What I see my father do, I do. What I hear my father speak, I speak. Father and I are one. What else does it represent? It represented his walk, but it also represented his stability of standing, his permanency of standing. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. When you're true and you're faithful to the Lord, nothing will knock you off your... Somebody help me tonight. Nothing will knock you off your feet if you remain true and you remain faithful. These ought to be the most sought off, sought, sought for traits in your life. <coughs> seek to be true. Seek to be faithful. Because they will become a habit. It will be a way of life for you. But it will help you stand when others are falling. 
It will create stability in your life. You'll be the kind of person with a character that people would only long to have because of your life and what it gives and represents. This is fantastic. Good stuff here tonight. Good, good stuff here tonight. Now you and I got up this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. What does it say? Read it together. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I want you to go to Luke 19, verse 17. Luke 19, verse 17. Luke 19, verse 17. And this, are you getting this? Everybody say, this is the final analysis. This is the final analysis. Let's say it together once again. This is the final analysis. This is the last song that's been sung. It's the last poem that's been written. It is the last sermon that's been preached. It is the last mile of the way. It's the end of the line. And... This is what we must strive for. Are you getting the picture? And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were what? Because you were faithful in a very little, in other words, some smaller things, have authority over ten cities. How many know sometimes we might seek promotion when we're not even looking after what we have now? Sometimes we're asking God for favors that we would seek greater benefit from this added favor from Him when we have not even been faithful with what we have been given. Why ask for something better? You haven't been faithful. And I don't want to talk about my kids. So I'm not. Maybe one time. You remember one of my boys, not this one, so I'll tell you which one it is. It's probably have to. I had asked him, would you paint white? Would you paint this lawn uh, swing? You know, it just sit on it, both sides, just goes back and forth. I didn't even do this. You're living free here. And he was not 10 years old. He was up there. <laughs> and so, and it would have been a job that Stefan, even as experienced as he is and myself back then, I was experienced in painting as well, it would have taken at least three hours at least. 20 minutes later, he comes back and said, all done. <laughs> You know, I thought there was only one way, unless he had a sprayer and just sprayed the whole thing down, which I knew he didn't. The brush was barely wet with paint. I said, no, you need to do the back of this. Well, it doesn't really need it. Who are you to decide what it needs? You were asked to do this. It, didn't, it wasn't left for you to decide what's going to be painted was not. You were asked to paint this swing. It should take you a minimum of three hours. 20 minutes, it was all done. And I knew it wasn't. So as he figured that the sides and the backs didn't need it, only what you can see at the surface. And it was kind of had lats, you know? And not between the lats, who cares? <laughs> And it had a roll back underneath, you know, where you lean back. None of that was done. But in his mind, it was done. And then he wanted to ask me for his pay and his compensation. I 
said, I'm going to tell you what kind of compensation that you're about to get. <laughs> Whereabouts would you like to have it? This is your compensation. Because you're not going to get it. You, know, well, you don't just... Then he borrowed my car. I said, if you take my car, make sure you turn left at the front of the road and not right. Because that's where I want you to go. Okay. He went out and turned right. And there was some uh, tree stumps along this side of the front of the road. And guess what he did? He hit them. Throw the whole front end out of my car. Now I was looking for not these, but a baseball bat. Um, I needed to take care of business here. Now this is the guy who wanted to have compensation. He wanted to have all the you know soup and nuts. He wanted to have all the blessings and all the good stuff. Tear the place up, have the job done. He just want. I said so. In other words, we want God's merit, unmerited favor, His grace to just be on a mother load of grace on us. But where can we look to God in our life and say, Lord, I'm not trying to gain brownie points with you, not trying to impress you, but it pleases me that I have done this for your name's sake. And I pray that this is pleasing in your eyes and that this offering is a righteous offering of what I've done for you. Does that make does that, is that huh? How many know that when we do things for the Lord, you can bring it up to the Lord? Not to try to impress him, not to try to excite him. Because, listen, the Apostle Paul, what did he do? He talked about Epaphroditus, who had worked so hard. He said, He deserves for what he has done your very best in consideration. And so you say, Lord, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to gain brownie points. I'm not trying to say I'm demanding this because I've done this. But in your name, I have done it heartily, heartily from my heart. And I pray that what I have done, and I'm giving it to you now, may it be pleasing to you in your sight and worthy of your grace and mercy. You can do that. May it be pleasing to our Lord. You would have mercy upon me and grace me, Lord. How many know that God can say, yeah, I can have that? So, the, what, in, look for the long haul. What does the long haul tell you here? The last day, when the last song is sung, when the last sermon is preached, when the last mile of the way has been walked, you want to hear him say, enter thou into thy reward, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in small things now. I'm going to make you master over many. So, in order for you to get that diploma with your name on it, it's called a diploma of faithfulness and goodness. Did we not talk about goodness a few weeks ago? That's one of the other ones. One of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. That's the diploma with your name on it. Good and faithful diploma. How many, how many like to have that? How many like to have God give you that kind of diploma? Ha! Yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh! Yeah! See? And it's a good thing. All kids in, in, those in college and university as well, they're, they're, they're working so hard to be able to get to that day when they have their cap on and down and they're walking across that platform and they're given their diploma and they're given their degree, whatever the case might be. I work for this and now my work is now validated. I've accomplished this. Someday, even if you haven't got a diploma from man or school or university somewhere, if you don't have a degree from a college, someday God will give you a diploma in heaven and on it will say good and faithful servant. How many like to work for that? Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what we're looking for. Hallelujah. Everybody say, Pastor, is having fun tonight. Yeah. Now, what's the fox? I'm going 
I'm not talking about the Fox Channel. All right. The Fox is discouragement. How many know that in your course of walk with God, you can, if you're not careful, become discouraged? Is that right? Yes. You can become discouraged. Yes. What, is it, what does it mean? What does the word discouraged? Diane, describe discouraged. <laughs> Break the word down in two. Break it down. Break down discouraged. Well, it's like giving up. You feel like giving up yes. because of everything that has happened to you. You're sad. All right. This, what? So, you had courage, now it's under the file of this. You got it? Discourage. You, the word dis, the word courage is in discourage. Alright, see? I'm giving you food for thought here. But yes, you get, you get to where you want to give up, like the answer is. You just want to give up. Why? Because the courage is gone. Yeah, so, but now that discourage, lack of courage is discouragement. Lack of courage. You don't have the drive to go on. Watch now. That's why it's fighting against faithfulness. The lack of courage and moral courage to go on is fighting against faithfulness. He said, no, you poor thing. You poor thing, you just give up, you poor baby. Oh. There's been so many that have had personal pity parties. Nobody showed up but you. And boy, what a party you had. And you almost become drunk of yourself. Drunk with yourself. Intoxicated with yourself. Inebriated with yourself. Don't go there. Do not allow the dis to touch your courage. Your courage comes from love. Comes from the very character of God. What if Jesus would have lost courage when he was being horse-whipped at the Passion? What if he lost courage? We wouldn't be here today. There would be no thing called church. The church. You never should never lose courage for what God has called you to do and never lose courage for doing the right thing. Never stop doing the right thing. Thing. Keep the courage. Now, let me give you Galatians 6 9. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. What does it say? Let us not grow weary in well doing. That's discouraging. Discouragement means a deflation or a demeaning or a reduction of courage. The discouragement in French is décourager, D-E, a D exotic here, décourager, means deprived of courage. Discourage means you're now depleted. Somebody help me tonight. <laughs> Discourage means you get depletion of courage. It reduces itself to dust in your life. Décourager in French means uh, this, the, this, this in English really doesn't. It is a décourager means a reduced courage. D is removed. D-E. For instance, breakfast, 
D, D, E, jene, means to break. It means to stop, it means to halt, it means to take away, to reduce, to stop. So, decourage, decouragement. Instead of discouragement, you should call it a decouragement. Because it really means a reduction of courage in you. How many don't want to go there? I don't want to go there. I do not want to go there. Keep the courage up. Do not grow weary in, weary in well doing means don't get discouraged in doing the good and right thing. Don't get discouraged. Don't get, don't let your courage deflate and be reduced by silly emotions. Now let's look at another scripture. Then we're getting closer to closing here. Second Thessalonians 3.13, Pastor Stephen. 2 Thessalonians 3.13. 2 Thessalonians 3.13. But ye, brethren, look at your neighbor and say, but you, be not weary in well-doing. <laughs> Don't let your courage, your, your moral courage, don't let your moral courage be diluted, diminished, reduced. Decourage means to take away, reduce it, to stop, no more, to reduce it. Don't do that. Your courage is the stamina. But where, where does this come from, this courage? From your faithfulness. Where does the faithfulness come from? Love. So everything that you need to make it in life has its roots in what? So, so. <laughs> everything you want to do and everything you want to have in life, <clears throat> everything you want to accomplish has its roots in love. The person that you want to become is rooted in love. There are two more of these attributes of love. One is gentleness and the other, or meekness. Meekness and gentleness the same thing. And then the last one is temperance, which means self-control. We're going to deal with that possibly next week. Then we'll start a new series for you. That's going to be quite illustrative on the board. You're going to enjoy it, I promise you. Money back guarantee. So, Pastor Stephan, if you will, can we get back that change my heart award? Let's go back to that, just those words up there for a moment. Hallelujah. Change my heart, O oh God. Fill me with your spirit. Take away desires that drive me far from you. I just feel in my heart in closing tonight. That if you want my prayer, if this speaks to you, change my heart, O oh God. You know you can't change your own heart. It takes the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. Right from your seat, just stand where you are, and I'm going to pray for you. If you ask God and you need a change of heart, whether you're a youth, middle aged or older, you want my prayer to stand and I will pray for you right now. Take away the desire. If you have desires in you that are pulling you away rather than towards God, then you need to pray. You need this prayer. Does anyone like to stand? Does anybody need that prayer? Look here. This beautiful young man. Starting tonight, you're going to 